Good evening. In this video, I'm going to be discussing the Reformation and Anabaptists as well as Rome. And the reason I bring up the Anabaptists is because, well, as some of you will already know, that it was the tradition I was raised in was an Anabaptist tradition. And so I've had to come to the Magisterial Reformation sort of as a journey of faith, um, discovering the Reformation and, and learning the ways of the Reformation. And it's very interesting because when we go back to the 15th century and we look at the theological kind of cross-section of what's going on and you understand what the Reformed and the Lutherans are sort of responding to, yes, of course, they're protesting Rome, right? They're protesting the Pope. They're protesting transubstantiation. They're protesting against indulgences and veneration of, of uh, saints and icons and these these sorts of things and rightfully so but they understand themselves to be catholics they are there they are a renewal movement of the one holy catholic and apostolic church they're not a revolution they're not innovating a new church they are seeking to recover right the historic and ancient practice of the church and they're not a restorationist movement saying that the church is somehow lost and we now need to restore the church or we're going to just start over with the church. <clears throat> Rather, they saw themselves as Catholics, small c, in continuity with the whole church. And they saw that the great schism between East and West was in many ways unfounded and, and a part of a result of pride and, and also the the false doctrine of the pope and his taking more and more power and such for himself so yes the protestants are against the roman catholics but protestants are not seeking to create a new church they are seeking to reform the one holy and apostolic, uh, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. But because the Protestant Reformation was this great disruption, right? Now, it had, had the Pope repented, right? Like, had, if the church had been able to reform more universally, perhaps some of this could have been avoided. But the Council of Trent really dug in its heels and anathematized Lutheran doctrine. And so it, it really deepened that schism. And of course, Rome always wants to claim Catholicity and continuity with the ancient church and say Protestantism just happened in the 15th century. But we have to understand that great error and apostasy and deception had come into the institutional church and kind of taken over the, the power structure, so to speak. And so you had all these continental churches who were sort of abandoned by their bishops and had to respond to that. And, the, and you had power structures where people were being excommunicated from the institutional church inappropriately for the sake of the gospel so the the institutional church had begun to persecute uh, true Christians but you saw you see places like Sweden and England for example where the ancient structure of the church was retained and the entire church as church was moved into the Protestant sphere so, again, it's not just a revolutionary thing where we are going to blow up the institution and start over. We're going to innovate something new. We're going to, we're going to get back to, you know, we're going to, we're going to be a new church. No, the, the Magisterial Reformation was a Catholic movement that was seeking to renew the church. And they were protesting against all of these developments and accretions and 
perversions of, of sound doctrine that had developed in the Roman church, in the Western church, over a thousand years. But because it was such a disruptive event, and people were being expelled and excommunicated from the visible church, and the Bible was being printed in the, the language of the people, a lot of people got a hold of these of a more revolutionary spirit, right? We call it the Radical Reformation, where there was a much more break with the institutional church, right? So the great irony, and this is just kind of an aside, but the great irony is that a lot of the Anabaptist uh, churches today are extremely traditional, very kind of locked in to traditional ways of being, and right? Whether it's like an Amish lifestyle or you can kind of think about maybe Mennonites or in my context apostolic Christians oftentimes there's this sort of very strong emphasis on tradition that can even sometimes trump scripture in, in this way of life and this sort of traditional way of being really gets emphasized and elevated but in the 15th century it was very much a radical spirit of responding to the institutional church but unlike the reformers who really saw the value of creeds and, and confessions and studied the ancient church and sought to be aligned with the ancient church for the radical reformation there was not just a rejection of the pope and these sorts of things that could clearly be demonstrated from scripture as being developments and accretions and just unsound doctrine and false teaching and great perversions, even of the gospel itself, they began to question all of church history and all of Catholic dogma, such that they even rejected the creeds at times. So the Anabaptists, when they thought about the Incarnation, they did not embrace that Christ was born of the Virgin, and they rejected the Athanasian Creed which clearly teaches us that Jesus took on the flesh of humanity through his mother. So he's, he's God of God, right? And he's co consubstantial, or he's of the same essence, right, of, with the Father. But that from his mother, he took a true humanity, a true human nature, both reasonable soul and human flesh subsisting. So the church believes because of what scripture teaches that Christ took on flesh from his mother okay and that through Mary he became he, he was fulfilling the reality that he's the seed of Abraham the seed of David the seed of Adam the seed of the woman this is who Jesus is but the Anabaptists had developed a theology that Christ had a different kind of flesh he didn't take the flesh of Mary because that was corrupted. Rather, he took on, or he, he, he was made human flesh in the womb of Mary, but that he wasn't actually of Mary. So he was born out of Mary, but he wasn't of Mary. And, and they would, and they really had a problem with the idea of Christ being of Mary. But, Again, as reformers clearly saw, Jesus has to actually take on the flesh. God didn't create new flesh, right? And they would go to, just like the ancient Manichees, they would go back to, um, you know, where, where Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15 of this, this heavenly flesh and this man of heaven. And the first man was a man of dust and he was a living soul. And the second man is a man from heaven and he's a life-giving spirit. But Paul has the resurrection in mind and the glorification of Christ's flesh and Christ's power to enliven and, and enable us, right? Paul says in Philippians, we await a Savior from heaven, Jesus Christ, who is able to transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. So in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus, Paul's not saying that Jesus in the incarnation took on a different kind of flesh than we have. Rather, they affirmed that, or 
Sorry about that. So, in the Incarnation, Jesus doesn't take on a different kind of flesh than us. He takes on our flesh. He became like us, the children of Abraham in every way. So, 1 Corinthians 15 is about the resurrection, about the glorified or the deified flesh of Christ's humanity, and that we're being conformed to that. So yes, there is a new humanity, but it's it's not a brand new thing. It's the same humanity that we have, but he, he shares in the flesh and blood. And as the ancient church confessed, whatever is not assumed is not healed. So Christ had to take on our nature, both the flesh and the soul, become true human so that he could save us, so he could redeem us. So it, it it's really and there was a couple different reasons for why the Anabaptists rejected the traditional teaching of the church. One of them was that they thought Christ, in order to be sinless, needed to have different flesh because Mary being a sinner herself uh, couldn't sort of give birth in this perfect man. Or in the similar way that Catholics believe Mary was preserved from original sin in the Immaculate Conception so that she could give birth to Christ and he could be sinless. So there, there's a, a greater emphasis on this sort of physio, physiological corruption of nature whereby either Christ is sort of created in this new substance or Mary's preserved blameless. But from a Reformed perspective, Christ doesn't have Adam as his federal head. <laughs> so therefore he's not under sin, right? He's not born of natural generation. He's, he's not coming from Adam. He's the seed of a woman. So he sort of creates this new humanity and, and this, there's this new federal headship. So it's much more covenantal and sort of this federal understanding of Christ and Adam such that it's not so much about the corruption of the actual physical matter but rather it's you're in Adam or you're in Christ and so Christ doesn't need his mother to be preserved from original sin from conception in order for him to have a pure you know body so to speak without sin nor do we need God to create Christ something new that's not actually the humanity the flesh of Mary so that's one that's one thing they, they thought Christ would be tainted in some way. But on the other side, they also thought if you affirm the incarnation the way it's traditionally been understood by the church, which is what scripture actually teaches, that Christ took on the same flesh as his brothers and sisters, he could be a faithful high priest for us and be our substitute and our mediator. He's the man Christ Jesus. He's the seed of Abraham, the seed of David. They also were concerned then about some sort of kind of universalist scheme. So you know, the only way you could really be a brother of Christ is to be born again. So they were trying to emphasize sort of the, the exclusivity of faith or being in Christ, or united to Christ. And they thought that the incarnation doctrine, sort of the way it was understood then, uh, would lead to a kind of universalism. That everybody is Christ's brother via the incarnation. And they were trying to distinguish between brothers those who are in the faith versus those who are not in the faith or not brothers so they were trying to make that distinction and the reformers were just like look <laughs> faith is what sets us apart right like it's he he partook of the same flesh and blood and hebrews even says he tasted death for every man like it's okay if he shares the same substance as the whole world that doesn't automatically mean that everybody is participating in Christ or that everybody is going to be saved in the end. It just means that Christ is true humanity, truly human, and is able to save to the uttermost all those who come to him in faith because he is our faithful high priest. He's a, like he is the perfect mediator between God and man who gave himself as a ransom for all, as Paul writes to Timothy. So... These are some of the issues going on. But again, you've got the Reformation responding to Rome. And, and we always think about that, like, oh, Protestant versus Catholic, or Reformed Catholic versus Roman Catholic. 
Protestant versus Papist. But what we often fail to appreciate is how much the Reformers were responding to the Radical Reformation. The Reformation that was see, kind of seeing itself as a break with tradition. And again, as I said, it, the irony of like the Anabaptists became uber traditional later. <laughs> so they reject the institutional church. They reject tradition. They reject, you know, the, the Roman Catholic way of doing church and even attack the creedal foundations of Christian faith. And yet it quickly turns into these very strict traditions that become very binding on their followers, oftentimes going way beyond scripture and not even having Christological substance, right? I mean, at least the like the creeds are Christological in nature, right? They are Trinitarian, Christologically substantive. Now, obviously, Rome develops other kinds of doctrines that are not so substantive. But it's just, it's sad when you see, okay, here's these Anabaptists who went back and they didn't just reject Roman overstep and papal nonsense they began to, to tear apart the very foundations of the historic faith of the church and then after rejecting this sort of institutional church and its traditions end up becoming a very incredibly traditionalist kind of church and and so you know when, when you're reading luther for example he will often say things like um You know, don't learn to mouth the words like the Pope and the fanatical sex. So, in other words, he he's consistently putting, like, fanatical sex, Anabaptist, on the same kind of wavelength as Rome. And now, especially when it comes to the subject of justification, you know, this is, and he, you know, he'll, he'll be talking about how Rome is speaking about justification, and he'll be like, and this is the same way the Anabaptists argue. Okay? So, the Reformation, properly speaking, right, the Magisterial Reformation, sort of facing two different directions. On the one hand, you're dealing with Rome, who's claiming the Catholic continuity of the ancient church, but has developed all kinds of nonsense, like the Pope, transubstantiation, indulgences, purgatory, Right? All these kinds of things that are not present in the early church. And then you have, on the other side, these Anabaptists who are rejecting history, rejecting the creeds, rejecting Trinity, rejecting Christo Christological statements the church has embraced for millennia. And so they're responding to both, right? Um... The Belgic Confession never mentions Rome by name, but yet it mentions Anabaptists in several articles. So in Article 19, or 18, for example, in the Incarnation of Jesus Christ in the Belgic Confession, he's talking about how Christ really assumed the true human nature. And again, whatever is not assumed is not healed. So if Christ doesn't actually take on our nature, then we're not saved. Like, we need him to actually take on our flesh. And the fact that he becomes a heavenly man and, like, he glorifies our flesh in the resurrection, like, that's good news for us. But that doesn't mean he has a different kind of flesh than what we have. No, he actually took flesh from his mother. Um, he's the seed of the woman. And via Mary, he's the seed of Abraham and the seed of David. And that's what we need him to be for us because he's a faithful high priest. He could taste death, death for all of us. But they talk about Jesus taking on the true human nature with all of its infirmities, sin accepted, right? Jesus is sinless. He's conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Ghost without the means of man. And he did not only assume human nature as to the body, but also a true human soul. They might be a real man. For since the soul is lost as well as the body, it was necessary he should take both upon him to save both. So, again, whatever is not assumed is not saved. So he's got to take it all on, right? He takes, he has a real human soul, 
a real human body because the soul that sins must die. So Christ, Christ's got to physically die, but he's also going to experience the the spiritual death, right? He descended to the dead. He's going to experience death holistically as a human. He has a human soul and a human body. And therefore, we confess in opposition to the heresy of the Anabaptists, who deny that Christ assumed human flesh of his mother, that Christ has become a partaker of the flesh and blood of the children, in Hebrews 2 language, that he's the fruit of the loins of David after the flesh, made of the seed of David according to the flesh, a fruit of the womb of the Virgin Mary, made of a woman, a branch of David, a shoot of the root of Jesse, sprung from the tribe of Judah, descended from the Jews according to the flesh, of the seed of Abraham, since he took on in the seed of Abraham and became like unto his brothers in all things, sin accepted, so that in truth he is our Emmanuel, that is to say, God with us. So they're just over and over like emphasizing he, he's the seed of David, he's the seed of Abraham, he comes from Mary, he's he's of the woman, right? He's he's, he's really our brother, he really took on flesh for us and for our salvation. He's very God and very man. And he, he had to take on the flesh in the incarnation to save us. But again, it's it's contrary to the Anabaptists. So one of the reasons why this is so critical today is because pietism and Anabaptist theology has really become prominent within evangelicalism. Evangelicalism is not of the same kind of thing as magisterial reformation, Protestantism, classical Protestantism, paleo-Protestantism is so different than the pietistic kind of Anabaptist flavored evangelicalism that many of us have experienced. And so even within traditions that look back to the Reformation and have confessional standards, things like revivalism and pietism and just the influence of these kinds of theologies over the last several hundred years, they've really moved us into a place where the way that we think about Christianity is incredibly divergent from what the Protestant, how the Protestant reformers understood themselves in their Catholic context and what they were about. And so we often project this sort of radical reformation back onto people like Luther and Calvin and Zwingli, Bootser, Vermigli, Cranmer. Right? We sort of project this revolutionary spirit and this radical break with the institutional church and with tradition and, and we're not Catholic, we reject all of that. We're restorationists, we're just going to live like the primitive church, we're just going to, in biblicism, right, we're just going to have our Bible. And so there's there's been this great kind of perversion of what the Reformation is and what it, what its goals were and how it understood itself and, and what it was seeking to accomplish. And we, ironically, because we've taken on this very Anabaptist, radical reformation perspective by and large we have we're misunderstanding luther like as i've been reading luther a lot over the last year and just studying historical theology more generally uh, a few weeks ago i listened to a, a great lecture by dr jack kilcrease on the, the history of the doctrine of justification from augustine to luther and it was fascinating. But I, I told a friend of mine, I said, most evangelicals today just simply don't have the categories to actually understand Luther. And it's not that Luther's like hard to read. He's incredibly pastoral. Uh, he writes in a way that's very accessible. But you really have to kind of Go back and learn some of the history and the developments to, to, to like get in his head and see like what's going on here? What is he responding to? And then and once you kind of do that, you're able to understand more fully what's happening in the Reformation. 
but there's a there's a strong corrective and even a, a kind of rebuke that we can receive from the Reformation because they would not approve of so much of what we're about today. And again, that's not to say that they were perfect or that they had everything correct or that there's no room for further developments or that, you know, I mean, one of the things I love about 39 Articles is it says, like, not everything has to be the same between all churches of all times and places, right? There's room for variety as times change and we can contextualize the gospel and there's different customs and, and these kinds of things. And that's okay, right? We, we don't have to become overly rigid. Sometimes people get kind of stuck in a certain century or a certain time period. It's like some churches may sing psalms only, but they do it with like 19th century hymnody. Uh, and it's like, okay, so you, you might sing like four-part harmony, or you could, some people are chanting psalms, or, you know, some people today are writing contemporary music to psalms, right? So it's, again, I, I would be okay with all of those expressions, but sometimes people think, oh, the only way to worship is just to do it this way. And it becomes very rigid and kind of narrow. And so I don't, I'm not trying to say like, we, we need to just go back to, you know, 16th century customs or something like that. The point rather is just that in the ways that we don't appreciate or don't even have a, a grid or a framework for what they were about. And so we sort of take this modern, individualistic, pietistic, kind of Anabaptist, fanatical understanding of the Christian life, and we sort of look back at the Reformation through this sort of distortion that comes through the Enlightenment and the revivalism, and we're like, oh yeah, the, Luther was just a radical revolutionary who broke with the church and me and my Bible we're, we, I don't need the church. I just have scripture. And that's not at all what the Reformation was about. In fact, the Reformers were spilling tons of ink to demonstrate their Catholicity because they were not trying to start a new church. They understood the importance of being the church and showing we are standing in continuity with Paul and the Apostles, with Augustine and the Fathers, Right, and even much of the medievals were still in continuity, and we believe, right? We confess, we believe the creeds, we are Catholics, but we see these perversions and these developments, these accretions that are inappropriate, and we want to we want to reform, right? We want our church to be to glorify God and not be a synagogue of Satan. And so that's you know, once you kind of get back into the great tradition and you understand the gospel in context, the Reformation in context, the importance of creeds and how the Reformers simply could not see themselves as outside the Catholic Church. And that's not a bad thing. Like, they understood, like, it matters. Right? There's only one church. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And there's, there's, that's it, you know? And so when we look back to the ancient undivided church, no, it's not perfect. But we have these creedal statements about the person and work of Christ coming from the scriptures that are safeguarding the saving truth of the gospel for us. The Nicene Creed right, says for us and for our salvation. So being Catholic in that sense is incredibly important because it's protecting the truth of the gospel, the mystery of Christ from false teaching. Right? I love to say the Christian faith has Christian content. The scriptures has revealed that the one true and living God eternally exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that the second person of the Trinity, for us and for our salvation, came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and made man, that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, that he was crucified, buried, died, right? He crucified and died, buried, sent into the dead, rose again, etc. Right? This is Jesus, that he's true God, true man, and so the Trinity and the incarnation of the Word, the Word made flesh, these are the central realities of, of Christianity, and they are essential to salvation, right? If Jesus is not God, we are not saved. If Jesus is not true man, we are not saved. Jesus has to be who he is and do and have done what he did 
for us to be saved. And so these, these creedal statements about Christ protect the central mystery of our faith. We worship one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we worship Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we, we worship and adore him and pray to him. We are not idolaters because we are praying to God. Because Jesus is God. And so we have these important elements. We have to understand that to be Protestant is to be Catholic. Small c. Because today, Rome tries to take over that word. But we are Catholic. We are part of the one holy and apostolic and Catholic church. And that is so, so important. So... I just wanted to bring attention to that in this video and say, look, the, the Reformation was a renewal movement. Matthew Barrett just came out with a, a new book called Reformation as Renewal. The Reformation was a renewal movement to reform the one holy Catholic and apostolic church according to scripture on that creedal foundation. And it was not only protesting the papists and their problematic accretions and perversions and developments that detracted from Christ and stole his glory. They were also responding to the Anabaptists and other fanatics who were just jettisoned the faith, rejecting the church, rejecting the creedal foundations of the faith. And they were responding to all of that and saying, no, yes, we protest the Pope, we protest Rome, but we also protest this radical reformation, because we're Catholic. And that's really important, because these creeds protect the central mystery of the gospel, which is that Christ is God and man in one person who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and saved us. So just wanted to kind of make that point. Um, another, another thing that's, you know, the reformer saw very clearly is that both Rome and Anabaptists conflated law and gospel, confused faith and works and justification. And so, you know, in the, in the Galatians commentary, Luther's over and over again saying, you know, both the Papists and the Anabaptists are doing this. They both emphasize love. They both emphasize works. They both minimize faith. Now, they pay lip service to faith in Christ, but they are emphasizing our works, right? So James does say faith without works is dead, but the point is, in the context of James 2, he's talking about faith on the horizontal level, right? The, authentic, the authenticity of faith manifested in its fruits before other men, right? Show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. That's a horizontal justification of faith, not the vertical justification by faith of the sinner before a holy God. But when you understand that, then it, there's no conflict. But what the Papists and the Anabaptists and what many, sadly, Protestants today have done the same thing, is they've used James to say faith alone is insufficient. Faith alone has to be perfected by love. Right? And so Luther would say they take gospel and they take law and they name them both love. But we see this all the time. People go to Sermon on the Mount and like, oh, that's the gospel because it's in the gospel. Or they go to the rich young ruler and like, oh, Jesus is preaching the gospel to this guy. No, actually, Jesus is preaching the law. Jesus is preaching the law to the rich young ruler. And so they're confusing law and gospel. They're mixing forks and faith. And they're messing up the doctrine of justification. And so instead of focusing on Christ and his perfect sufficiency for us, outside of us, and receiving him and resting in him by faith, the emphasis becomes on, well, love is the essence of justifying faith, essentially. And so you have to keep the law to know you're a Christian. And you know, no matter how you parse that out, you functionally teach 
works. So this is Luther's commentary on Galatians. He says, With this doctrine today, these lying spirits and sects of perdition darken and disfigure the benefit of Christ. They diminish the honor of the justifier and make him a minister of sin. They haven't learned anything from us except to mouth our words, but they don't understand the subject. They want to make it look like they also teach the gospel and faithful faith in Christ as truthfully as we do. But when it comes to using and practicing it, they are teachers of the law, equal in every respect to the false apostles. So he's, he's making the point that you know, the Papists and also these Anabaptists, they are teaching, right? They, they want to make it look like they're teaching faith in Christ and the gospel just like we are. And maybe they even believe that they are. So they have a language of faith in Christ, right? Rome, Reformers, Anabaptists, they all have a language of faith in Christ. But Luther's saying, but when it comes to using and practicing law and gospel, they are teachers of the law. And then he makes the point that these Galatian Judaizers were going teaching throughout the churches to require circumcision and the keeping of the law in addition to faith in Christ. So much so that without these things, circumcision and the keeping of the law, they denied justification. No, right? Unless you are circumcised, they claimed, according to the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. In the same way today, these rigorous vigilantes of the law require that in addition to the righteousness of faith, you must keep the commandments of God. Okay? This is why there is not even one among them, no matter how wise he claims to be, that understands the difference between law and grace. So, Luther's point is, when you say faith in Christ, but then you teach, you have to be circumcised and keep the law, right? You're denying the gospel. That's what Paul accused the Judaizers of. And bring that forward into our context, right? When you say that you're justified by faith in Christ, but you have to keep the law to abide in Christ or keep the law for final justification, you're teaching the law, right? You're undoing faith in Christ. You're overthrowing people's consciences. You're you're undoing the gospel, ultimately. It's a false teaching. When you say it's faith in Christ, but then you have to have these certain rules to follow. It's like in my context growing up, it was like, that, but it was superficial things like you can't go to a ball game, or you can't wear shorts, or you have to wear a certain color shirt on Sunday, or you can't have facial hair, or you have to wear your hair a certain way, or you can't have jewelry or you can't drink alcohol, or you can't do this, you can't do that. All these man-made rules and customs and traditions that were sort of added to faith in Christ. So there was, there was always lip service to faith in Christ, right? As he says, they also teach the gospel and faith in Christ. They, they want you to they make it look like they do, right? But when it comes to using and practicing it, it's all law. And so that's what we, you know, I've experienced that. And then moving into evangelicalism from that Anabaptist tradition, started quickly discovering, oh, everybody else is teaching the law too. You know, so I've kind of had to come on this journey through pietism, through two-tiered justification, through the revivalistic tradition, through Anabaptist, you know, through fanatical things, through radical Christianity, revolutionary spirit Christianity, and discover, okay, actually, faith justifies apart from works of the law. We, we need to recover law and gospel. And so Martin Luther has been the best at helping me recover law and gospel. Many people today, whether I'm listening to Theocast or you know Eric Sorensen's Law and Gospel Devotions of 1517 or Chad Bird, now Michael Horton, um, Justin Holcomb or David Zoll. There's so many people who do a great job of distinguishing law and gospel in the historic sense and recovering that John line ball. Right? He's, he's got some fascinating work on that. But the point is, 
the law and the gospel being distinguished was key to the Reformation because the heart of Paul's gospel and Paul's doctrine, when you read the epistles, especially Romans and Galatians, but it's everywhere else too, you see the distinguishing between law and gospel. There's a kind of word that says, do this and live. Cursed is everyone who doesn't do all that's written in the book of the law. And there's another word that says, Behold Christ, the bronze serpent on the pole, and have everlasting life. Right? Simple faith and a finished work by a faithful Savior is enough. So you have law and you have gospel. And of course, Galatians 3, 10 to 14 is sort of this very pointed juxtaposition of law and gospel. It's the clearest place where law and gospel are distinguished by Paul. But you see it in, in the book of Romans. You see it all through the epistles, the book of Ephesians. Colossians, right? It's it's there. And so there's a way to teach faith where you add love, you add affections, you add works back into faith, whether you redefine the definition or you make a two-tier justification. There's all these ways when you add traditions and customs, circumcision or Judaizing tendencies, the moral law or the uh, sorry, the ceremonial law. You can, you can add all these things back to Christ, and what you effectively do is you empty the gospel of its power. And that's what Luther is so adamant to oppose, and that's what Paul was so adamant to oppose. And so, really, the, the, the Reformation was just that sort of, the spirit of Galatians just surging back through the church. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Right? O oh, foolish Papist, who has bewitched you? O oh, foolish Anabaptist, who has bewitched you? And recovering justification by faith alone. So again, you've got the Reformation as a Catholic movement, a renewal of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And then they're protesting the problems of the Papist, but they're also avoiding the dangers of the fanatics on the other side. And I think a lot of times we don't understand that. And, and one of the reasons I'm bringing this up in this video is because it's my conviction that one of the things we need to have a modern reformation to help Protestants recover their own tradition and heritage and the gospel is understand how the reformation is different from Anabaptists. That these are key distinctions that separate, and that separation is a good thing because it distinguishes between the Catholicity of the Protestant tradition and the revolutionary spirit of the fanatics. And since most evangelicals today have a Anabaptist sort of framework, a revivalistic, pietistic framework for thinking about Christianity... In order to get back to the Reformation, we have to sort of move through these juxtapositions and help people lay hold of Christ. Right? I'm constantly encouraging people to read Martin Luther. Like, there's a reason why he's the one God used to start the Reformation. So, if you're not reading Luther, you ought to be. But the point is, is that, you know, all of us, all these sort of evangelicals today are like, yeah, we're not Catholic. Catholics are works-based. But they don't even, the great irony is that a lot of them embrace the exact same kinds of doctrines that Rome teaches. In They're the exact same thing that the Reformers were rejecting when it came to justification. And so you have all these people who are sort of anti-tradition, anti-Catholic, and yet they don't even see that... Number one, they're different from the Reformers in their creedal and Catholic identity. And then they're ironically so close to Rome and their understanding of justification and the gospel. And the Reformation wants to give us back both, both the gospel and the Catholic Church. So that is my encouragement to you. Keep reforming, keep studying, and you will be blessed. So God bless.